Shalom, shalom, mishpoka. Welcome to another edition of Ray Bash's Ramblings, where today I'm going to be talking about reconciliation. Reconciliation is a topic that is often misunderstood and taken out of context within the realms of Christianity and Ansari Judaism, or Messianic Judaism, especially in the realm of charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity, for the simple fact that um, many people tend to believe that that uh, if you have an enemy, um, a, you know, not necessarily somebody that's an enemy of the faith, like a Satanist or a Muslim or whatever, but an enemy, somebody that you're supposed to be family, whether biological or whether it's spiritual, whether you're supposed to be of the same faith, if you have an enemy within that, uh, they feel that, oh, you've got to do everything you can to reconcile things and, and, and to make sure everything's all fine and dandy and, um, you know, it's not always possible for the simple fact that reconciliation is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. It takes two people to make reconciliation work, to make reconciliation happen. Uh, and if only one party out of the two is willing to do that, then there's no reconciliation. You can fast, you can pray, you can speak in tongues, you can beg, you can plead, you can do whatever you want, but reconciliation is not going to happen. Um, I have had, in my personal experience, several people that I can think of right off the top of my head where I have tried to reconcile uh, differences with them, and uh, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, you know, you hear, uh, kill, it, kill them with kindness, you know, no matter what they do, love them. Remember what Yeshua said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. You know what? Yeah, that's great. All that is fine and dandy, and that's what you should do. But that doesn't mean that you're going to make this reconciliation come about. If the other party is not willing to reconcile, it's not going to happen. And you've got to uh, accept that fact and move on with your life. Um, I, think, I think the danger that many um, believers feel that if they don't make reconciliation, they feel that the danger is that that unreconciled difference between you and somebody else uh, will turn into a root of bitterness or hate. And yes, naturally, of course, that is one thing that must be guarded against because when you have irreconcilable differences with someone, uh, they usually treat you with contempt. They usually treat you in an abusive, uh, inhumane way. They may have uh, barbed or snide remarks. They may um, you know, do things that, that uh, people shouldn't do to one another. And if you don't take that attitude, Father, forgive them for, for they know not what they do, then yeah, bitterness can, can uh, breed. But there's only so much a person can take. There's only so much a person can handle, so much abuse that they can throw love at to combat it. Um, and it's almost inevitable that, that bitterness will, will start to seep in. So the only thing a person can do before that happens is to remove themselves totally from that relationship, remove themselves totally from that situation. Whether you have to cut off all ties, change your phone number, change your email address, whether you have to move out of the neighborhood, whatever it takes to get away from the abusive person, the abusive situation that has this irreconcilable difference, do it. Um, I relate it to the story of Jacob and his father-in-law Laban. He was brought into Laban's home under, under peaceful terms, married his daughters, and then after a while, um, because of Jacob's prosperity, uh, his father-in-law became jealous and started treating him differently. He noticed this ill treatment, this different treatment, this double standard that Laban had towards Jacob. He was being used. He was being abused. Now, you know, should the should the modern Christian, the modern uh, um, uh, messianic, say, "Oh well, you know, uh, the patriarch Jacob, he should have just stayed and just loved Laban. He should have just killed him with kindness, and because he was his father-in-law, he should have just loved him and treated him with respect, and 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 bless God that that love would just melt away any any indifference and any hatred that Laban had." No, that's not what happened. You know, you can't force somebody to love you. You can't force somebody to reconcile themselves with you. If they're not willing to do it, God even can't make it happen because God doesn't go against another person's free will. 
that person doesn't want to reconcile, God's not going to force them or, or, or you know, shoot them with a Cupid's arrow to make them love you. It's just not going to happen. So the only reasonable, logical, correct, spiritual, biblical recourse is to remove yourself from that situation. You don't have to take that abuse. Turn the other cheek does not mean you turn yourself into a welcome mat and continue to take that abuse and say, oh, bless God, I'm taking this persecution and this abuse in the name of the Lord. I'm, I'm, you know, and then you'll get a martyr complex. Come on. You know, you, that's not what you should do. You have to remove yourself by whatever means necessary from that person and from that situation. It, it doesn't mean that you stop praying for them. It doesn't mean that you, you become bitter towards them. It doesn't mean that you hate them. Make sure that when you leave, you leave on acceptable, peaceful, loving terms, at least as much as within your power to do so. Whatever they leave with, it's not your responsibility, not your care, not your worry. The ball's in their court. It's between them and God. We see in this in the Brit Chadesha where uh, Rav Shaul, Paul, and uh, Barnabas had to uh, had to, had an irreconcilable difference and had to part ways. It said that they had you know something very heated between them. But it doesn't mean that they left not loving each other. It doesn't mean that they left hating each other. It doesn't mean that they left bitter with each other. They had to leave because it was an irreconcilable difference. Some say that it was the issue of John Mark, uh, Barnabas's relative, uh, that caused this breakup, this split, because he was green behind the ears and he got homesick on a missionary journey. You know whether or not that's the fact of it, we're not entirely sure. But we do know that um, you know there's a hint that he reconciled his difference with Barnabas. Doesn't say that they got back in ministry together, but that hint is that later on in some of Rav Shul's writings, he says, I want John Mark with me. He's proven himself to be profitable in the ministry. So that's kind of a hint of reconciliation. So this is a very dicey and hard subject uh, to traverse, but I hope I've uh, edu educated you a little bit, gave you some uh, hope, some tips, some pointers on a possible, God forbid, an irreconcilable uh, relationship situation that you have in your own life. Because I've had to deal with it uh, God has blessed me to get through it and blessed me with the knowledge on how to deal with it. And now, because, you know, to make trials a blessing, you, uh, you know, take things in your life and you teach others. And you show them what God has done for you, what God showed you in that situation. So we'll see you next time. Shalom and Shavuotov. Bye-bye.